In the classic science thriller, The Day the Earth Stood Still, a flying saucer is tracked around the globe before finally setting down in the heart of the U.S. Capitol. While audiences were entertained by the idea of alien invaders coming to Earth on screen in the confines of their local movie house, few gave serious thought to the possibility that such things might happen in real life. To many, the concept of alien visitation remained within the province of the burgeoning genre of science fiction. In the 20th century, Illustrators for books, magazines, and posters reached new pinnacles of creativity when it came to depicting the places of which nightmares are made, the unknown and the spellbinding. Gee whiz. But some of these outlandish stories no longer appeared within the pages of a comic book especially when a man named Kenneth Arnold made newspaper headlines around the world when he spotted nine shiny disc-like objects over Mount Rainier, Washington in 1947. The objects appeared to skip like a dinner plate over water, and so it was that the term flying saucers was born. And also born were the stories of bizarre alien encounters in those early days. These denizens of the UFO you are about to meet consist of the strange, the unusual, and the unearthly. For the most part, they are the forgotten stories of creatures, UFOs, and the people who encountered them. Many of the witnesses to these events and their locations will appear here for the first time in this extraordinary encounter with monsters of the UFO. was nobody knew but it began here along the banks of the Ohio River on the afternoon of August 14th 1955 near Dogtown Indiana not long after she and her friends reported sighting a shiny object in the sky that resembled the bottom of a bushel basket Mrs. Darwin Johnson told the Evansville press that fuzzy claw-like hands grabbed her in the Ohio River as she and others were enjoying a swimming trip the experience was terrifying after pulling her under the water twice the creature or thing apparently released her as she swam to shore for safety whatever it was that had grabbed hold of her leg had disappeared as mysteriously as it came or did it whether the incidents were related or not one week later the sighting of bizarre alien creatures that appeared in Kelly, Kentucky would go down in UFO history as perhaps the granddaddy of the early humanoid encounters in America. Here again is Bob McGahey. Don, there were a number of stories this year that captured the interest of all the community. But from the standpoint of interest, I don't see how one could help from thinking first of the spaceship landing at Kelly and the little green men that it carried. At 2.30 on the morning of August 22nd, the telephone ringing at my house awoke me, and the following conversation ensued. Hello? Bob? This is hard. Spaceship has landed at Kelly and little green men all over the place. Oh, wait just a minute. Who'd you say this was speaking? It's a reader. I sent a spaceship that landed at Kelly and little green men all over the place. I just came from there. Made a picture. Wait just a minute. You mean to tell me that you've got a picture of the little green men in the spaceship? No, I didn't get that, but I got a picture of the man who said he saw him. All right, now let's go back to the beginning here now. You said a spaceship landed... Now, that was Harvey Reeder, a photographer with the Kentucky New Era, recalling to tell of this fantastic story. While it is easy to discredit the incredible tale you're about to see, one must remember that what happened here was witnessed by more than 11 people. 11 frightened individuals who never attempted to gain any publicity for what transpired the night something landed near this field. Just eight miles south of Kelly lies the picturesque community of Hopkinsville, or as the locals call it, Hoptown. Located in scenic Christian County, the area is rich in Civil War and Indian history, as ghostly echoes from another time seem to linger here among long-forgotten structures. 
In this building, local historian William Turner has kept colorful records of the city's heritage. Although he was only 15 at the time, Mr. Turner remembers the incident at Kelly as if it happened yesterday. It was August of 1955 that um, the news broke of a very unusual event, uh, the likes of which had never been experienced before in the life of Hopkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky. Over the years, tales of alien creatures have challenged the imaginations of both writers of science fiction and the public at large. Everything from pulp fiction novels to the movies have portrayed fantastic images designed to create fear or wonder. But fear and wonder can sometimes touch down in the most unlikely of places. Here along the old Madisonville Road near Kelly, Kentucky, on land formerly owned by tobacco farmer Gaither McKee, something extraordinary transpired here over 50 years ago. A frightening encounter with the unknown that would stir the souls of a bewildered community. It's not difficult to imagine the sense of wide-eyed wonderment that greeted readers of the Kentucky New Era when they read this front-page article about an amazing and scary encounter by some of their citizens with creatures from another world. This is Elmer Sutton Jr. and his family who currently reside in Caddis, Kentucky. It was Elma's father, nicknamed Lucky, and his friend Billy Ray Taylor, along with eight others in their family, who would gather at the Sutton homestead on the night of August 21st, 1955. They were just simple people, just simple country people, you know, honest type people. The house was sort of run down and old, uh, just a simple life and, and farming and trying to make a living. You gonna play him again, Billy? No, I reckon I know when I'm licked. Besides, I ain't got another dollar. When Billy Ray Taylor left the kitchen to fetch water from the nearby well, little could have prepared him for what would happen next. As he began to fill up his bucket, something unusual in the air caught his eye. This is Larry Bernanke! Come quick! You ain't gonna believe it! I just seen something weird fall out of the sky. A uh, bright light or something, I don't know what. It, it went lickety split across the field out there, and then it looked like it landed somewhere down in the gully. Here he goes again. Billy Ray, you are not only a bad card player, you are a very bad liar to boot. Oh, why would I lie about something like that? And it scared him so that he, uh, that he went inside to tell his family in disbelief. They uh, put him down as a joke and told him to, you know, they sort of said, you know, don't be doing this again, you're there. doing this all the time. You got daft in the head, Billy Ray? You trying to pull a fast one? What the hell would I do there? No doubt Taylor's story amused the family. Maybe it was a shooting star, Billy. Apparently they were not in the habit of taking him seriously and soon cast it aside as a practical joke. No one even bothered to walk out to the gully on the chance that something was there. Maybe it was a shooting star for all I know. I think your brain is a shooting star, son. Very funny. Before long, darkness fell over the small Kentucky homestead. At around 8 o'clock, Lucky's dogs began to bark violently as if an intruder was on the property. What in the blazes is going on with those darn dogs, Lucky? I told you to get rid of them varmints. I can't hear myself think, let alone read a good book. Shut your trap, Vera. You be still. As the men stared out the window, they were startled to see a strange glow coming from the fields beyond. Lonnie Langford was 12 years old when he and the others encountered the mysterious invaders at Kelly. His mother was Glennie Langford, also the mother of Lucky Sutton. 
She and Lonnie, as well as his siblings, Charlton and Mary, would soon become witnesses to the impossible. Oh, there was a house full of people there, and they was all terrified. Instructing the family to stay inside, Lucky and Billy Ray warily walked outside to get a better look at their uninvited visitor. What in the name of God is that? As the thing came nearer, they could make out what seemed to be a small man, though a man unlike any that they had ever seen before. Please, please, go inside. Everybody, you stay put and you don't make a sound, or I'll rip your ever-loving hide if you do. Oh, Lord. Lucky and Billy Ray would take no chances. Horrified, the two men raced back inside and grabbed their shotguns as the others looked on in stunned silence. Back outside, an unearthly apparition was moving silently towards them. What on God's green earth is it? I don't think God's got nothing to do with it, Lucky. It's getting closer, Lucky. It looks just like a little man. I ain't never seen a little man with ears like that. A goblin. That's what it is. A goblin straight out of the pits of hell. A goblin. What are we going to do, Lockie? Shoot it. Shoot it. <laughs> but it didn't hurt them. It just kind of rolled up in a little ball and kind of rolled back down the hill over there where the ship was. Inside the house, the men were confused and dazed, not certain what to do next, while the rest of the family, especially Glennie Langford and the children, remained vigilant next to the bed. Land of Goshen, Lucky, you're nearly scaring those kids half to death. For God's sakes, woman, there's a thing out there. What kind of a thing is it, Billy? The kind of thing the good Lord never intended be in this universe. Now, do you hear me, woman? We have got to protect our home. Oh, good Lord, Lucky, why did you have to go and shoot it? It probably never meant us any harm. You might have killed it. You ain't kill it, Lenny. I mean, our, our bullets sound like they hit nickel plate or something. It ain't human. And what ain't human don't deserve to live. My name is O.P. Baker, and I was in the house that night, and I saw them creatures. O.P. Baker, the brother of Eileen Sutton, was 30 years old in 1955. The farm laborer lived in Hopkinsville at the time, but often stayed overnight at the farmhouse where the person with whom he rode to work could pick him up more conveniently than in town. Today, he is the only known adult survivor who was present on the night of the close encounter at Kelly. Back then, I wasn't going to old church, and I started church, and I've been going to church ever since. I remember we all were sitting there, about, uh, I'd say around uh, 8 o'clock, we heard a, a noise on top of the roof. Listen, Mom, listen. There's something on the roof. Uh, it is told that these beings were on the roof, scratching and clawing, uh, trying to get through the ceiling. And uh, the children and uh, mothers and such that were in the house at the time were trying to hide, trying to get away from this. They were all scared. Make it go away, make it go away, please make it go away. There was one on top of the house on the awning. One of them was scratching on the window. I mean, they were like curious, wanting to see what was going on. As the guns being shot, uh, I don't know if whether it was on the, the far side of the house or this side. I, I do know that they said they, they come over. They say the curiosity killed the cat. But in this instance, the curious just grew more curious as the unknown beings once again emerged from the shadows. Well, he said they would come up to the windows and they just kind of stick to the side of the house like a spider could. And he said they just kind of peek around the window sill with their head and some old big beady eyes and they just look in the window and just stare. Oh! My 
my screen. I jumped up out of the bed and I looked out the window and I saw them. They were about three foot tall, had pointed ears, webbed feet and hands, and big round eyes. We had a uh, uh, great big ears. I mean, big ears. And you could shoot them and wouldn't hurt them. And uh, he said they'd stare until one of them blow them off the window seat. Once you blow them off the windowsill, he said they run outside and shoot one again, and by the time they got back in the house, look at the other window, there was another one looking in the window. Don't shoot those things, Nancy. Don't be stupid. Stay back and stay down. We got interlopers. Yeah, I was real scared. I was in the corner of the house on the floor, and everybody was running around there just panicked. I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on. Christ almighty, what the hell is going on here? Hell is the right word, Billy. What do you think's going on? God help us, Glenn. I don't know. I just don't know. I think it's demons more than likely, Billy Ray. Hell has indeed come to this little house tonight. I think I killed it, Lucky. I couldn't have missed it such a close range. Well then, why didn't it lie prone to the ground, JC, just like any normal human being? You, you, you do know what happened the first time we shot it? Well, I don't care if it's the devil himself. I'm going outside to finish him off. Him, his minion from the deep, dark outer space or wherever he comes from. I believe it was a 20 gauge they was using, my father had. I believe Billy Ray had a 22. JC had another shotgun. And they was all three shooting these things. None of them could make a, a hit to actually kill one of the creatures. down and got him by the hair of the head. One of the little men picked him up by his hair. And then that's when they started shooting. And all the little kids, like my age, were under the bed. They were terrified. I can't say for sure, but I do know that there are there are uh, facts proving that something of a higher power had landed in their backfield. direct hit on the creatures, it sounded as if their bullets had struck the center of a metal bucket. They just never could kill one of them. It just seemed to bounce off. He said it was a battle. They get on the window sills and scared the women, they had to come in and blow them off the window sills and then they get seen on the window sills and they run outside and see where they were and they'd be in the trees and they'd blow them by the trees. a direct hit, the creature seemed to defy gravity as it floated off and landed in a grassy area several yards away. Cautiously, the shooters moved towards the spot where they believed it had fallen. To their surprise, a luminous glow appeared on the ground where the thing had been. These beings, these creatures, whatever they were, wherever they were from, displayed almost a very unusual intrigue and, uh, I guess, curiosity that is uncommon with this type of phenomenon.
According to the witnesses, the creatures seemed capable of extremely rapid movement when running away, and it was impossible to tell whether there were several of them or whether there were only two or three that disappeared from one place and reappeared very quickly in another. After a short time had elapsed, there were no further signs of their inhuman visitors. Seizing the opportunity, they gathered their family together along with the children and decided to make their escape. And according to the people interviewed at the time, those individuals in the car were in a high state of excitement, and that's putting it mildly. They were beside themselves with fear, with anxiety, with wonder, with apprehension. Suttons and Langfords eventually arrived at the Hopkinsville Police Department. At the police station, the officers on duty were struck by the family's behavior to take immediate action. Although skeptical, the Christian County Sheriff's Office, which was located here in the same building with the city's police force, sent a deputy sheriff and telephoned the staff news photographer of the Kentucky New Era. Almost immediately, Police Chief Russell Greenwell was appraised of the situation at Kelly. Calling him at home, the desk sergeant on duty that night informed him, a spaceship has landed at Kelly. If this is your idea of a joke, Greenwell answered, it's not mine. I'm not joking, Chief. The state police are sending units there. It wouldn't be long before Greenwell and other law enforcement officials made the trip down lonely country roads back to the deserted farmhouse. And immediately the police went into an investigation of the house and the surroundings to determine if there was any evidence they could find that would give credence to the story. One of the troopers who went to Kelly that night was Officer Russell N. Ferguson of the Kentucky State Police. While he admitted that the family seemed to be in a high state of anxiety when he and the others arrived at the farmhouse, the little men were nowhere to be seen. The area was thoroughly walked over, very much so. Behind the house, in the woods, the field behind the house, and around the house. But uh, they, were, they were telling us about the people that were on the roof trying to get into the house. They had uh, tried to repel them to keep them from coming into the house. They'd shot at them several times, and uh, obviously they didn't get in. While it is true that others in the Kentucky countryside had been arrested for illegally operating moonshine stills, officers on the scene could find no evidence that the family had been drinking that night. According to those who knew her, Glennie Langford, the solemn matron of the Sutton clan, never allowed alcohol on the premises, especially when children were present. And Glennie was a very moral woman. She was, uh, she was a Pentecostal lady. She went to church and she didn't have nothing on her mind but serving God and raising her family to the best that she could. But something terrified Aunt Glenny there that night, and she moved out. The first officer to arrive at the farmhouse had noticed a few shotgun shells in the front yard, but none of these were picked up and saved. When a local newspaper photographer and reporter interviewed Lucky and Billy Ray outside, their reaction was, of course, skeptical to say the least. Well, I, I described him about as good as I can. I could see the fear in his eyes when he told me the story. And I know for a fact it happened. My father would not make up a story like this. He was not that kind of man. He was a he was a country man. He believed in making a living for his family, and he didn't believe in playing jokes. I ain't never known him to pull a prank. Never. You want to take some pictures of them, Oh, uh, I think I got enough pictures yeah, I for pictures. now. Okay. In the months and years to come, offended by the apparent lack of belief in their story. Many of the family members rarely discuss the incident for fear of public ridicule. While police and several MPs from nearby Fort Campbell were unable to turn up anything conclusive about the reported creatures, Chief Greenwell was impressed by the family's apparent fright. In an interview with UFO researcher Isabel Davis several months later, he told her that the Suttons and Lankfords were so scared that they refused to go inside the house until after the officers had completed their investigation. There's evidence that those people were shooting out there at some time. Plenty of bull holes everywhere. Surprising, no sign of moonshine either. 
One point of skepticism brought forth by the officers at the scene was the discovery of an almost perfectly square bullet hole found in one of the screen windows where some of the men had fired their weapons at the goblins. They were indicating, the people that lived there, that uh, they had had to fight these creatures off, and they had shot at them. And uh, they had fired at them with a shotgun, they fired at them with a rifle, but through this window they indicated they shot at them with a shotgun. The screen that they had indicated they fired through had a square hole in it, one inch square precisely. And there was a square hole. That's the first square shooters I ever encountered, and I've never found the weapon that fired that shot. The assumption by some was that the Suttons, in order to stage a hoax, had taken a tobacco stick, which is a stake an inch or two square used to support these growing plants, and had poked it through the screen to simulate a gunshot. Other small perforations found in the screen that night indicated that gunshots had indeed been fired through the window. According to ballistic experts, several of the holes were perfectly consistent with the area of a shot pattern at so short a distance from the gun muzzle. I've been in the firearms industry for the last 20 years. Uh, before that, I was in the military for four. I'm also state certified, federally certified, and nationally certified with the NRA as an instructor. Uh, after observing the Kelly picture, I wanted to try to recreate the hole that I saw uh, in the picture. I took a shot with a 12-gauge shotgun uh, at 10 feet. The pattern, as you can see, is very consistent with the pattern in the screen. Now, the screens are made up of a series of small squares. So when the screen breaks away from the shot, it can very well and most likely leave a square hole. So, so whatever the Sutton saw frightened them and they were definitely shooting at something because those are gunshot holes. To add to the controversy, the next morning during a daylight search of the house, Police Chief Greenwell found shotgun pellets embedded in a corner of a splintered section of the window frame, further evidence that something had stirred the Suttons into action. While no trace of little green men could be found in the vicinity of the Sutton farmhouse, a close encounter of the feline kind did occur. That's it, baby. Hold it right there. Perfect. Now, you say this uh, little green man was jumping around in the trees? He was uh, right up there, squatting right up there in the trees, sir. Was he doing like a little jig, or was he like dancing? He was squatting right up there in the tree right there. Ah, so. oh, up there, okay. Okay, I need both y'all to look right over here. Oh, damn cat. The discovery that this alien was nothing more than a yowling tomcat was a moment of relief for those who had been affected by the charged atmosphere surrounding the house that night. Yet, there was an unknown element lingering in the air that could not completely dispel the Kelly invasion as a figment of a family's collective imagination, the element of fear. Most of the officers were reluctant to express any opinions about the reported invasion, but all seemed impressed with the evident fright and sincerity of the highly excited family. A check with neighbors disclosed they were not prone to drinking, and no evidence of alcohol was found around the place. All the witnesses told practically the same story, with only minor variations, depending on what part of the house they were in at the time of the happening. One of the theories that some of the skeptics had about the Kelly incident was that some circus monkeys had escaped from a traveling carnival known as the King Circus that had passed through town. The idea that monkeys was the cause of this incident was totally ridiculous as thought by many UFO researchers, including Isabel Davis. Um, monkeys are hairy creatures. They have long tails. They're chatterboxes. And you would think that seven adults would be able to tell the difference between a monkey and something supernatural. And this was something supernatural, because if you shoot a monkey, a monkey is going to fall down and die. While it is true that police officials were unable to find any tangible proof that something had landed in Kelly, there were others who believed they had witnessed something unusual that night. An officer in Chief Greenwell's department, a Sergeant Salter, reported seeing a glowing light in the woods just behind the Sutton home. But when he investigated, he found nothing. 
Oddly enough, an unidentified state trooper and his wife said they heard a loud swishing noise, looked up, and saw a bright meteor-like object rising into the dark skies over Kelly while en route to the scene. Uh, there was a state trooper that reported that he saw something back towards the, our farm or in that vicinity that looked like a flying saucer or a meteor. One of the state police officers was supposed to have seen something on his way up there. And uh, what he saw, nobody knows. The officer that, uh, rumored officer that reported the incident of something over his head said he saw a bright light. Several people who had been leaving a local eating establishment known as the Shady Oaks Restaurant claimed to have seen lights dancing in distant fields not far from the site of the invasion itself. In spite of the skepticism shown by his police force, Chief Greenwell confessed that while he may not have been convinced of the existence of flying saucers, he was definitely impressed with the apparent fright of the witnesses. He declared to the press, something badly frightened those people out there, something not of an ordinary nature. Around 2 a.m., everyone except the Suttons left the homestead. The house once again stood quiet and tranquil. As the family finally slumbered off, Lucky and Glennie fell asleep in the living room. But somewhere, outside in the darkness, something watched and waited for one last opportunity to make its presence known. Lucky! Lucky! Lucky. Whoa, what, what is it, Mom? Oh, for God's sake, don't! Lucky. I'm going to shoot that little man! The next day, newswire stories across the country startled the public with stories about the weird events at Kelly. A WHOP radio announcer named Bud Ledwith made these sketches of the creatures after extensive interviews with the family. It is reported that a newspaper reporter from the Evansville, Indiana Courier adopted a journalistic license and decided in his article to refer to them as, quote, the little green men of Kelly. And there, the, the AP picked it up and it stuck. To many people, the concept of little green men may seem like the wildest kind of fantasy. But on the contrary, many of the Kelly witnesses had not described little green men at all but said that the creatures were silvery or metallic gray in color. But no matter how they may have appeared to the witnesses, the simple fact remains that something had indeed frightened a large group of people collectively and at the same time. And it would only be a matter of days before the Suttons fled their home for good. The house was soon to be occupied by the Eugene McCord family, cousins to the Langfords who were present during the alien encounter. Today, Norma Malone and her brother Wendell McCord share fond yet scary memories of the time they spent there. My dad purchased that place. I was scared to death. Uh, we lived in the house where these creatures were seen. Uh, the house was uh, a little old and worn, and uh, it had trees outside, uh, had a big yard. Uh, I remember it just feeling sort of warming and homey because I was sort of young at the time. And uh, it was just home. And all my cousins were scared to death, and I remember going up there the next morning. My cousins wouldn't talk to me about it. My aunt wouldn't talk to me about it. I still actually don't know what happened, but I know that my cousins won't even to this day talk to me about what happened down there. So it must have been something real that happened. It was Norma and Wendell's mother, Juanita McCord, who posed for this photo in 1955, shortly after the Langfords and Suddens fled in terror. While the debate rages on as to what exactly happened here more than 50 years ago, others believe that something returned here during the summer of 2000, something not of this earth. As strange as this case seems to appear, it may not be that unique because just five years ago, uh, they, people in that area were sighting strange craft in the sky, delta-shaped craft, triangular craft, hovering. 
And these have been very frequently observed over the last 15 years throughout Europe and the United States. I was not a believer till the summer of 2000 when I seen the lights in the sky in Kelly, Kentucky. A young man came in and said, I want you to see these lights. Well, several of us went outside and there they were in the sky. Almost a triangular section of lights uh, that just hovered. Um, it gets even odder. Uh, some people near a restaurant saw what looked like a, perhaps the diminutive Grim Reaper, you know, cloaked, hooded uh, type of an image. And as bizarre as this image appears, um, I have cases in my own files where people have actually observed entities similar to this, not in hauntings or ghosts, but in UFO cases. can't ignore the possibility that things have perhaps been recurring on a semi-regular basis. One of the ladies that works at the restaurant when this happened the night before when we were all there, she went in to open the next morning at 5 a.m. and she saw a dark figure standing on the side of the road and it really scared her and she refused to go to work. The next morning my niece seen this black hooded something on the side of the road and it really scared her. And she went in and opened the restaurant anyway, but she locked the doors behind her because she was so scared. Her husband was with her, and he went in with her. And then about 15 minutes later, my other niece was coming to work to help, and she seen it. is a totally isolated incident or that maybe this spot has some unique attraction to these type of things and therefore there's ongoing events that are overlooked by the media or by the people living there. We don't know. The mystery behind the Kelly Green men may never be solved. If we can believe in the possibility of unknown forces that sometimes intervene in the affairs of men, then it is entirely possible that creatures from another world or somewhere else may very well have landed in this remote Kentucky countryside. I think, yes, there is a possibility of something unexplainable occurring there. The Chief Greenwell made many trips back to Kelly to interview members of the family, trying to pinpoint the validity of the whole story. He was uh, skeptical about everyone he interviewed except the grandmother. And he said when he interviewed the grandmother each time, one thing, she stuck to her story all the way through. And also there was fear in her eyes that uh, he questioned she must have seen something that absolutely scared her from amazing grace to float an opportunity. These people were very honest people. They couldn't make a story up like that. No, my mom was honest. She was a good, real good Christian. This, this is not something that they would make up. They just couldn't make up a story like that. If they wasn't convinced that there was something there, their stories would have would have varied from, from over the years. I mean, somebody would have added something, somebody would have dropped off something, but their, their stories are, you know, are, are, are the same. Uh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget what happened that night. Uh, it was a very extraordinary event. It's a mystery in the respect that uh, uh, no one's ever been able to say yay or nay, refute or not, uh, whether an incident did occur there. If I could talk to one of the creatures, I would just like to know maybe why and why you picked Kelly and my family. There's no way 11 people would share the same hallucination. That does not occur, which strongly suggests that something real and substantial, and perhaps tangible at some level, triggered their experience. Well, what was it? Maybe history will tell us. The incident at Kelly 
remains as mysterious today as it was 50 years ago. The significance of the strange events that occurred here will perhaps one day be realized when science and the supernatural meet face to face in the distant future. But for now, we must listen to the surviving voices who must tell the story for a future generation to hear. For locked away in the Little Kelly Cemetery less than a mile from where their encounter took place lie the mortal remains of good country folk who perhaps, just perhaps, were the first humans on Earth made witness to the first war of the worlds. I believe very firmly in the world of science and nature and religion that a lot of things occur for which we human beings have little or no explanation.